Uh, so I am Asher Remy Toledo. I'm the director and founder of a uh, hyphen hub, an organization based in New York City that works with uh, a artists and creators working on emerging technologies. And it's the, and I'm very honored to have uh, with us today Claudix Vanexis, um, an artist um, uh, born in Peru and uh, is currently living in Europe. Uh, through different uh, different countries, uh, spending uh, the time between you know, Denmark and Germany and other places. Um, so, uh, uh, how are you doing, Claudix? <laughs> I'm very good. I'm very happy. Uh, it's super interesting also to be presented like I live in Europe <laughs> because ah. I'm not familiar with, uh, yeah. Identity is a crisis, yes. Yes. So... Well, I just came from Europe yesterday. From uh, I was at Arts Electronica, and it's the, well, still a little bit jet lag. And uh, hopefully, you uh, hopefully I'm not going to make any uh, mistakes thinking that it's three a.m. But mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, we are going to talk about the piece that you um, that you have with uh, Refest, and it's called Dance Permit, um, and it's a. Uh, Dance Permit is, uh, I'm going to read a little bit uh, what the piece is about, so I don't make any mistakes. It's, um, it says, Dance Permit Deny It, in, a, in parentheses. It's an immersive film that uses artificial intelligence and performance, performance art to challenge gender norms in traditional religious dances in indigenous Peru. It's an autobiographical documentary about the traditional dance of Claudic's family, Los Negrasos de Sipsa, that explores a centennial view on the themes of gender, memory, and reinvention of the ancestral. Um, and is, um, Claudius has been working for many years in a performance uh, and a film and virtual reality. That's the, and uh, she combines uh, immersive media with machine learning and performance art that reflect about internet culture Digitality, which is the the hybrid between physical and digital, and algorithmic patterns in society, and uh, she has participated in many creative residencies, and, and also including Arts Electronica, uh, which uh, she actually probably I could say this she got some uh, honorary mentions uh, in Arts Electronica. So uh, congratulations on that. And just uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about um, what we uh, we are going to see a little uh, trailer about your work? Uh, why don't why don't we start with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's see the teaser of the project, and then I can further elaborate on yeah on some of the topics. What is the role of gender in our tradition? How does a dance get reinvented? Dance Permit is an immersive video performance for virtual reality that uses artificial intelligence to challenge gender norms in traditional religious dances in Peru. This is the story of the dance of my family called Los Negrasos de Sipsa. To belong to this tradition, you need to be born inside the family of dancers. But you need to be born among. This dance is a life cultural heritage passed through generations by fathers to their sons. My grandfather taught his sons and my father taught my brother. But if you're born a woman, what is your role in this tradition? Cooking, embroidering, taking care of the children and the elder, amongst other activities. For this project, I trained several generative adversarial networks with self-portraits to investigate the abstraction of gender expression. Later versions of 
this research involved elements of the traditional costume. Collaborating with AI in this creative process was very refreshing, as it provided me representations that were human-like, but that could not be limited by biological sex or social understanding of gender. It also reminded me that this was my fantasy and that these dancers did not exist in real life. I did. I understood the importance of my gendered body for bringing the actual social impact that these questions hold for my family and my community. So I danced. I was confronted for doing this project. Does creating a suit makes me a dancer? Certainly, it is not the visual elements of a tradition what hold together a ritual. Gender roles are getting more visible in traditional and indigenous spaces. And new generations of grandchildren are reclaiming back their spaces and the right to participate in their own cultural heritage. Okay. Um, okay, here I am. A back. Um, yeah, how um the length of the work is about 10 minutes, yeah? And it's uh yes. virtual reality. Um and in this uh so you've been working on um performance. How do you start your um when did you this actually ask kind of few questions in the in one question? <laughs> And when did you decide to become an artist and and also activist? And when were you kind of so self-aware mm -hmm. that you were binary and, and and therefore you pretty much you were born political because you had to be you decided to take a stance and, and uh, mm -hmm. on where you were instead of staying quiet, silent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a, a super complex and composed question, <laughs> but I did notice, and lately I feel a lot what you just said, which is my existence is just very political. The fact that I'm talking in English right now, for example, exactly. you know, uh, a lot of things like the kind of fabric I put on my on my body, you know, how much I show it, how much I hide it. Um, I think being born as an indigenous person within a globalized uh, context will certainly provoke a lot of tensions when it comes to what the public perception of what an indigenous person is. So there is a lot of rigid thinking on what should we look like or what should we be talking about. How should we express ourselves and if we are allowed or not to participate in conversations that are not thematized on indigeneity? For me, it, the art and the activism came together. I, I, I noticed that I was born into a very expressive uh, artistic tradition, but I didn't acknowledge it as art when I was younger. Just, just when I grew up, I noticed that there was a uh, dance from a European perspective that was considered dance, but not my family's dance. That was folkloric expression, right? And, and there was like this difference between uh, what is known in, in Peru as art and folklore, like artesanía, we call it, which is like a form of degrading the local fo forms of artistic expression. And so I do, I do believe a lot what you just said about uh, these existences uh, are very political. And um, I think the question about gender came a little way, way later actually, um, together with other important uh, philosophical waves like 
feminism. No? So when there is uh, different kinds, kinds of feminisms being acknowledged in, in Europe or in USA, the reality hits in South America uh, that uh, we are just a very different context. And to talk about the um, conquer of the economical or political spaces is not the most important uh, fight for recognition for women in the global south. It's different. That's why we call we talk about the colonial feminism. And dance permit, I think, is a great expression of a decolonial feminism because we need to think inside our families and we need to think about the structure of this patriarchy that we are born with and what are its roots. In this case, it's uh, colonization, right? So, okay. Yeah, uh, you mentioned colonization, which is, um a very important thing um and and it's just like you know and i'm just i'm based in the us and i um, just came back from europe yesterday so like two uh big uh colonized colonizing regions and it's just um so the uh the fact like how's the um you know we, we were um discussing about the you know the 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 fact that this, the, the colonization thing on uh, on uh, on the indigenous communities um, they uh, you know force their, uh, their their traditions like specific, specifically the Catholic religion, which is uh, to erase the uh, the culture the ancestral ancestral uh, yeah heritage very much. So how how much did that, did that impact your family? When when were you aware that actually or what you have lost? In terms of um, of the of the original, you know, mm. traditions and uh, the things of your town and 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 everything that has like now pretty much everybody has taken it as it is as a fact, and they are they are not aware of what has been lost. So, mm -hmm. and and I think with your work, it's kind of a, a little bit of a call to reclaim part of that. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, it's super interesting because I noticed that you can only understand who you are once you have enough space and perspective, like even to look at yourself from the eyes of the others. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I don't think uh, it was ever questioned the um, the state, uh, you know, of the gender roles inside the family or even the traditions that we were. Uh, being uh, the her, her, you know, the cultural heritage that we had, I never knew that was special. I just believed everyone in the world belonged to a family that hold together a tradition of a particular knowledge. And so it is when the globalization really hits me through the internet, I noticed that no there is a difference between my local life and my global life. Other people have other types of local life. And for me, it is when I noticed um, I was living a, a city life, but I had this heritage from uh, being a rural life uh, family. And I think there's a lot of things that I noticed I lost and I felt mutilated. The first shock was the music, I think, because there is huge tendencies, you know, trends, musical trends worldwide. Like you said, USA has a huge cultural impact on the whole South America. We consume, consume their music, their movies, their TV series. So we are almost like cultural colonies from USA. Um, and I noticed that I was missing narratives of my town, of my country. Like, you understand? That's the mutilation that I, that I feel like uh, we went through. Like, what, we, what did we lose? We lose interest to hear our own stories over stories of other countries. Um, and we lost the language. Uh, so that is mostly what I what I notice also now living in the globalized context. We lose visual identity as well. Yeah. 
So how is it in your, <clears throat> did you grow up speaking um, Quechua or Spanish? What was the main, the main language that you, in, that was spoken in your family? So my family is from Ancash and that is the, where the uh, film is based. And uh, our indigenous language is called Quechua. And when my family migrated because of the violence happening and during terrorism, migrated to Lima, uh, they decided to no longer teach Quechua to the kids. And this is not something that happened in my family. That is something that happened in the whole uh, Lima. There was a huge wave of migrants that tried to hide their roots. And I think now there is a lot of people like me that we are grandchildren, that we were not taught our original languages or our original traditions, that we are now reclaiming back. So it's like a whole cycle. We, we, we migrated to Lima and now we are migrating back into our territories. But we don't, it is not like nothing happened because we are coming back to our territories and we're coming back with technology Right, we're coming back with English as well. Now it's like a, a feedback, a contamination, you know, global uh, impacted local, but local also impacted the global, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it could be say contamination, but also is enrichment, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are, um, and, um, and, and talking about that, you mentioned technologies. Uh, when, <clears throat> When did you, uh, I think about, I asked that question before, but I'm not sure if I got an answer. Your answer. When, when were you aware of that you were binary? And, and also, when did you start noticing that maybe the, I don't know, internet? Uh, and then this is going to lead me to AI and all those things, but, uh, but that, that would be a, a, a channel for you to express yeah. yourself. So it's first the binary when you were, were aware of yourself being different. Mm -hmm. And when you decided to, that maybe the new media was the channel for you to speak out yeah. to yourself. Yeah, there's a lot of confusing things going on there uh, as point of self-enunciation. For me, I think the most determining one was feminisms. Yeah. Um, and being critical about the experiences that I went through because I was born and socialized as a woman it led me to a space of rejection of such uh, label. So I first transitioned as a masculine, but then I noticed that the masculine was also very oppressive form of existence. And I, I became uh, familiar with other forms of indigenous traditions that do not only contemplate the masculine and the feminine, but also uh, one person that can be both or that can be none of them. Uh, that was very inspiring, but that was not my tradition. And that forced me to face what is the state of the gender roles within my own family. Um, in, the, in, in that process, there was also some other uh, influences around me. And there is, of course, the um, trans, the, the trans umbrella that was um, being very important for me from the artistic perspective, like being transdisciplinary, uh, but also understanding gender as a spectrum. So not longer considering myself as a masculine or a feminine. Uh, but a person who is in the in-between, so we call this uh, gender fluid or non-binary uh, gender expression, which, which is how I um, identify as. Mm, but I think it's very, it's very interesting that this would uh, be mixing, you know, the art, the art became trans when the person became trans as well. So there is this media that merges uh, the importance of the body, of the performer, like what is this body, what is happening to the body of the performer, but also what are these other layers of digitality that uh, make the body become a trans media. 
uh, how it collaborates with artificial intelligence as well. I think that's what what makes the trans um, umbrella that I identify with. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so you are kind of a, your work um, is uh, I mean, since so you are, I would say, hybrid person, you know, so the, uh, your work is also it's a collaboration between the technology and the human. So it's not the, uh, and also you live your life as such. So you you embody that 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 thing, that new hybrid. Uh, to use the word that I hate, uh, meta, <laughs> but it's still uh, that's not very comfortable with with the word. But it's a uh, unless you have a, a better better way to express it. Um, but it's um, how do you see like the two working together and like and now that you are using artificial intelligence how and how are you using mm -hmm. it to, uh, Oof. yes to yeah it's super super hot topic i think and the, this is two different technologies one is extended realities here we have virtual reality augmented reality mixed reality and the other is ai artificial intelligence. There is so much in so many fields happening here right now. So to be honest, I focus on one small part of artificial intelligence, which is called deep learning. And specifically the technique that I use is called uh, generative adversarial networks. So I use a little bit of this and a little bit of this together with live performance. Um, I think that there is a lot to be critical about with the use of these technologies and most of it we can observe in the hardware which is the actual material display of the technology how is it being uh, produced you know but also in the software like like the invisible part of it which is who's writing the code under which assumptions and this is what we call the bias. So as a person from the global South, I think it's very important that we acknowledge this very high developing moment we are living with artificial intelligence and to be critical about it and decide to participate in a way that we can still be aware of how far we are going, for example. In this project, I use the family archive, photographic and video archive of my family. And for that, I have the consensus. I have the consent. But when you try to use this artificial intelligence that generate images or videos, and you, you cannot be specific about an ethnicity. So you say indigenous futurism. And what the AI right now understands for indigenous may be related with uh, feathers that is not compatible with, with my tradition. So uh, this is a very uh, big and, and like I said before, highly speedily developing. But if we are not participating, like if we are not diverse, diverse group of people who's training these data sets and enriching these libraries, it ends up being a very ignorant and very confident form of um, creation. So yeah. it, it is not in, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue of colonization. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think that, that the most uh, uh, Thing that I feel proud about with this project is that uh, I get to participate on what my family's ethnicity look like and is represented. And what I hate about it is that I, 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 I also uh, ask myself, should I have done it? Or would have it been better if I've never shown the AI how we look like? Like, like a for, as a form of protest, like should you should you never capture our faces and try to recreate it? And I think it's a very important question that creators have to ask themselves as well. Because if we don't train it, other person will, and yeah. without our consent. Yeah, of course. So that's like a dilemma we have right now. They will show their version of the, of the reality, uh, which is very limited, you know. 
already painted. And it's the, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and there is a, a major problem we have with the uh, AI and its size. For example, the um, the people that are training those, um, you know, the AIs, um, the entities, they, they are based on a written texts or photographs. Uh, what about uh, stories that are now written, like especially in uh, <clears throat> some you know indigenous groups or nomad groups, uh, <laughs> all those things that are not um, they 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 only the only form that the only way that we know about it is because uh, a white guy from England or France usually <laughs> went there and uh, wrote down what they what they saw what they experienced, but it's mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it is really nothing coming from within. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So what how are you addressing yeah. those? Okay. So I I noticed that I accidentally created the first immersive documentation of the dance of my family. When I saw it on the VR headset, I was shocked because I got this uh energy, this knowledge about this media is super fragile, right? Yeah. Virtual reality is super fragile. The files could be, be lost. The hardware could stop working. It's fragile. But within that storm, I managed to be the one to tell my own story. And that is amazing, I think. Like it's an immersive video. It is uh, 360 uh recording documentation of the glaciers that i've seen melting since i am a kid you know and this uh the church that i recorded three months later when i recorded the church was taken down the town looks completely different now why was so, it taken down? um because the mining uh will build a new one you know, it, it is, uh, it's a very political, of course, uh, s- underlying story. Uh, the thing is, this, this valley is uh, rich on minerals. So in order to, to be sympathetic with the town, the minery will build a new church. But in the meanwhile, there is no church. And it's important for the town that there is a house for the Virgin. But what I'm trying to say is I, I, I understand that we are living in a very, uh, very relevant moment for self-representation. That it be me, a member of the community, to challenge the community. So don't, we don't uh, get, again, this um, white person who can only see the surface of what's happening in a whole, I call it party, in a whole celebration, you know, the dance is just part of the celebration. But really what is going on is there's a lot of families uh, making deals with each other about land, making agreements on how the crop uh, seasons are going to be. So it is bigger than just the surface. And I think it's important that members of the family get to talk about their experiences and be critical and be self-critical. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we have the tools now for documenting ourselves. Like I yeah. did it this time with a 360 camera, but of course there is another type of storytelling happening, for example, in TikTok, yeah. you know, short format videos. <laughs> Is it like now when you mentioned about the taking down the church? Is there has there anybody brought up the you know the questioning uh, the imposition? Like for example, the church or the the Virgin was um, was replacing the older the older traditions. You know, the uh, pre-Hispanic colonizers. I I don't I don't think so. I I, I haven't uh, heard about it at least in my family. Of course, yeah. there's a lot of families in the town. Uh, but the, the thing I, I think it's in, important to understand about syncretism is that it was a generation long process. So right now, my family is devoted to the Virgin, which is a Catholic Virgin. Yeah. And there is no longer this open wound 
about having lost our deity, which could have been the mountain or yeah. the storm. Uh, yeah. Now it is the Virgin. She is our deity. We dance for her and we celebrate her. Uh, but for that to happen, there was a deity that was taken down. And I think right now there is no longer this huge pain about losing it, but you can still see the, the, the reminiscence of its existence, like on how the, how the head of the Virgin is just like a mountain, you know? Yeah, it is a mountain. A veil, a veil, yeah, exactly like that. And what about the binary? Because um, in in some uh, in some cultures, uh, like some indigenous cultures, or some uh, other places in uh, Southeast Asia or stuff, there was the gender roles were uh, more fluid. Yeah. And, uh, before before the um, white colonizers went there and imposed their their way yeah. to along how what this should be just male and female and it should be heterosexual yeah. only and such so it's um i i've talked about this with friends who identify as a, a body with two spirits yeah. uh, that is that is again not the I, I have never organically received that information from my family line uh, but what i do observe a lot happening in in, in dances in peru is there is a lot of transvestism, like there's a lot of drag, you would call it, but you don't call it drag, right? Um, but there is more space for bodies that are born as a male to present as if they were born as a woman. So that is uh, allowed, let's say, within the tradition of dances in Peru. What is not allowed is women to participate. Yeah. So let's say even in the binary logic it is not equal like men would represent woman but woman would not even represent woman and yeah. for sure would not represent men and that is the performative element of this film that i would get to wear the suit of the man um and, but uh, what I know for other traditions uh, that are also thinking of uh, the colonial feminism, it, it all, almost is very similar. It is again, the, the people who is born male that is allowed to dress as a woman in a special occasions. But so, a woman a woman. Yeah, so that is very less likely that a woman that uh was born and socialized as a female would be allowed into those spaces of representation and again i think that is the most political event to be allowed to represent yourself and to be allowed to represent others in a public space so that is also the dynamics of power that we are trying to deconstruct when we talk about a decolonial feminism because we, we have different fights than uh, other Northern feminisms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, have you personally done it? Have you tried to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the when you show your work that you are actually dressed as a man and you participate in this uh, male dance, have you done it in, a, in real, real yeah. life? In a way? Yeah, yeah, I-, I What has I, been the- it, it is response, yeah. very it is very complex uh, for doing this work. I engaged with a very hard to resolve crisis within my family, uh, especially with my brother, who is a traditional dancer. Uh, because there is things we do and there is things we don't, right? Yeah. And for in, uh, for my family, it was very it was very daring for me to do it, to dress as a man and to dance the tradition because there is a hierarchy that you should obey. Okay. And that hierarchy starts by the grandfather, then the fathers, and then the children, and then the grandchildren. Yeah. So, um, uh, we we are kind of uh, wrapping up the, the conversation and I just, uh, 
Uh, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions uh, before we close up. Just uh, please type them in the, I think, the Q&A chat, chat room. Um, and it just, uh, but, but yeah, in the, mean, in the meantime, you know, if, uh, if I don't see any, what, what would be, if I don't see any questions, then uh, what would you like the, the audience to, and the, the people that have experienced, that experience your work, Mm -hmm. what would like them to to know like to take with them you know i think i think it's uh, very important for me to break stereotypes yeah I, I that's something that i feel very important part of my activism is to understand that uh indigenous people from different regions speak english and are globalized and engage with technology and that does not mean that we don't longer care about our indigenous culture, investigate and question our own family's tradition, and that we are still able to re-elaborate on that past for building a future. I think that is what I really want to share with other people who identify or as indigenous or that has a cultural heritage that is problematic because most of the times we get um, this cultural heritage as if it was a stone that cannot be changed. Because if you change the tradition, it's no longer a tradition. Tradition is protected by those who practice it and it is changing uh, together with our, um, oh, there's a question, yes. It's, it's uh, changing okay. with us. There is somebody here from an um, audience, from uh, Dai Kim. Um, I'm curious about how virtual reality technology translates to your performance of fluidity. Is there something specific about the technology for self-representation, self-critique? Hmm. How does VR translate into the performance of fluidity? Well, yeah, I, we, we haven't got uh, much time to talk about it, but uh, one of the concepts that I investigate a lot is called digitality, And it's the reunion of physicality with digitality. So I am this body. You right now cannot share a space with me, only time, but this body exists in a certain space. And most of my practice as a performance artist involve having my body or my naked body as a life meaningful material together with layers of digitality. And this can be augmented reality. So you see my face naked, but you also see my face with a filter, which has a different uh, signification. For example, in Dance Permit, there is this clown phase, like for a moment, like clown, clown, stupid, stupid, stupid feeling that we add with augmented reality. And in the when when virtual reality appears for me, it can lose fluidity when I'm not there. And that's why I like being there together with the artworks that I present. But transmedia work has this flexibility right? It will exist without me. It can exist with me there. Um, but I think it's very important. Virtual reality melted my brain. Uh, if that's what you're asking, like in terms of fluidity, because it let me understand that what I experience in the physical world, such as the loss of physics, do not matter in this media. What you consider like size proportions, the passing of the time, the rigidity of a body, the physics, everything is different in virtual reality. And that really impacted my, uh, my personality, my gender expression. I noticed that uh, my body is as personalized as an avatar. Like, and, and that I explore more in other of my artworks, not precisely Dance Permit, but I really like these questions because um, I think virtual reality 
impacts physical reality. Like its mere existence already challenges the materiality of the world. And I'm very excited to see how new generations also um, be self-critical and uh, in, even uh, how, how they dematerialize their identities by existing wildly in the digitality. This is already happening. A lot of yeah. younger generations have uh, si simulation theory in their heads and behave like video games. I think it's, it's just a part of our mirror behavior. You know, we understand ourselves through the highest level of technology we achieve in the moment. Yeah, so, we, uh, yeah, because no, that is one thing, like, uh, where, where are we going? I mean, we are, we are, we are wrapping up right now, but it's, the, but there's a question where, where we are heading now that the two, the two worlds are, um, are finally colliding, uh, but it's about how do we make a, um, a good transition that is not a, a, something that will destroy us, but how do we embrace these new technologies that yeah. are now part of ourselves and, you know, almost becoming like, um, well, yeah, the dual, dual realities, but also cyborgs, in sense, to use the word, which is, I know, is um, how would you define, because you're not, you don't, see yourself as a cyborg is a, is a term that is very also like colonial in a way and uh um so what would you use in your in your case if, if it's not the word mm -hmm. i've used cyborg before but i think when you you when you say cyborg you immediately yeah. your your imagination goes into narratives of asia or narratives of usa and i don't know if it's a south Global South that needs to think in those conditions. I don't have a proposal for what should we call ourselves yet, but I'm sure it is related uh, with uh, a new form of futurism yeah. and okay. that thinks of time in a non-linear way. So it's not like past is here and future is here. It is, yeah. we're always spiraling. And we, uh, that's, that's why if I say I come from the past, it's very similar to say I come from the future. And yeah. if I say I'm a storyteller from the future, I, I might as well be a storyteller from the past. The past telling, yeah. telling the stories that were told like generations ago, but that in certain contexts can now be perceived as futuristic stories as well. Because technology is not only mediated yeah. by hardware technology is also um, l l um, relationships we have with each other you know and with other you know animals and plants I, I that's the kind of futurism I'm interested in and I and I know it's happening afrofuturism is a huge inspiration for me solar futures is a huge inspiration for me and like you said it's about not going binary it's not denial of the existence of the other. So yeah, it is right. a spectrum. A we can live, we can live together with nature and technology. Nature will uh, accept technology, technology will accept nature. This has to be true because none of them can stop existing. That's none of them can, can yeah, stop that's existing. A, that's great. That's a beautiful way to end. And I um, wanna thank you very much, uh, Claudix, for uh, your wonderful presentation that was um, very enriching and uh, thank you everyone who participated in this uh, chat um, and thank you Culture Hub for uh, making us part of your great festival refest yeah okay thanks. thanks thanks for having us bye bye bye